I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. Our guest speakers share their images, tips and techniques, and a little bit of inspiration to help you improve your photography. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Lori Cash. Lori is a wildlife and nature photographer based in Hampton, Virginia. Lori's photography focuses on conservation and visual storytelling while bringing awareness about the biodiversity around the Commonwealth of Virginia. Lori is a member of the North American Nature Photography Association, also known as, known as NAMPA, and she's also a proud member of the Professional Photographers of America. Lori's won numerous awards for her photography, and just this week, her work, her work was featured on the cover of 22 American Butterflies magazine. In tonight's presentation, The World of Wildlife Conservation Photography, Lori's going to share her tips and insights on how you can make an impact in the world of wildlife conservation photography. If you're on Instagram, look for her at LA Cash Photo. And please visit her website at lauriacash.com, where you can also subscribe to her newsletter and check out her blog. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Lori. Before you get started, ma'am, I gloss over, I tend to gloss over people's bios. I try to get as much as I can find, but what did I miss? Is there something, you know, that I should have mentioned that you, you'd like the, you'd like the, the gallery to know? Um, well, I also recently um, I had a cover image on Virginia Wildlife uh, Magazine okay. um, with um, my uh, a little fox kit um, looking up to uh, um, it's, its mama that was actually taken on Mother's Day. So um, I've had a, a good little run these last couple weeks with um, or months um, with um, some back-to-back -back, um, covers on magazines. Um, so I'm curious, are you submitting them or are they finding you through some form of social media or is um, this your full-time job? I'm not even sure if this is your full-time job. Well, um, I have recently uh, made this uh, um, my full-time job and became an LLC. Oh, good for you. And, and um, both of these um, covers came through actually um, photo contests. Um, one, um, the American Butterflies um, also had a monetary um, award and uh, Virginia Wildlife uh, is just a showcase um, issue that they showcase uh, Virginia photographers um, through um, images that, that the photographers in Virginia um, submit. Um, so, and I was honored to be the cover image for that yeah. issue. Yeah, that was a that's a beautiful shot. And you know, last week some of you were here, some of you were not, but if you missed it, um we had Paul Malinowski uh do a presentation on cracking the code on photo contests and that is on the YouTube channel. So if that's something you're interested in, uh you just emphasize that hey, contests do get people's attention. So uh, congratulations. Yes. Thank, thank you. I, um, I, I, I highly recommend photo contests because uh, I've been getting um, a lot of recognition this year from um, numerous um, places that, okay. I've, um, when, um, that I have made through uh, um, a handful of contests this year. So it, it does get, get your name out there. Okay. Um, 
Well, that's wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm glad, that, <laughs> I'm glad that you can share that story because it just tied in with what we did last week. So that was unplanned, but that works out <laughs> great. <laughs> that works out great. It emphasizes what Paul had to say. All right. With yeah. that, do you want to, do you want to jump into your presentation or did you want to say anything? Yeah. Oh, okay. share, share my screen now. Sounds perfect. Linda mentioned I am a, a member of NAMPA and uh, the Professional Photographers of America. Um, and uh, a little bit of, about the overview of tonight's presentation. Um, I'll be talking a little bit um, about myself. i um, just giving you a little background about my photography history. Um, we'll also talk about what is conservation photography and storytelling. And then we'll also um, touch base on the emergence of conservation photography. And um, then, then we'll go into um, the more specifics of wildlife conservation photography and the different types or styles of conservation photographers and storytellers. And then we'll get to the tips on how you can use your photos to help save and protect our natural world. Um, so a little bit about, about me, um, I bought my first SLR camera, which was a, a Pentex K1000 back in 1990 when I was stationed um, in Maine in the Coast Guard. Um, I, I always kind of grew up with cameras in my hand, but when I got there and saw the, the beauty of the landscapes of Maine, um, I began um, photographing landscapes and kind of learning photography on my own. In 1992, I um, moved down to the Virginia, North Carolina area and spent 20 plus years concentrating on bird photography. Because so now here, I, I was on the coast near the Outer Banks of Virginia, uh, Outer, Outer Banks of uh, North Carolina. And um, so, a lot of birds there. So um, I started um, focusing on bird photography and I learned a lot of my bird photography skills by studying um, from Arthur Morris, who's one of the most known bird photographers there is. Um, I even took an IPT um, um, uh, down in uh, Southwest uh, Florida one year with him for several days and learned a lot from him. Um, and I also, um, well, I was um, just starting out in the early 1990s, took some college um, photography courses, um, one especially in wildlife photography and, and creative design. And the wildlife photography course is um, the one that really inspired me to um, move from doing landscapes to wildlife photography. And then over um, like uh, my 30 years in photography, it's hard to believe that, um, but I've been doing um, photography since 1990. Uh, I have had the privilege to be published in a variety of publications um, that include the Virginia Wildlife Magazine and the American Butterfly Magazine and um, um, some local um, conservation um, uh, publications here um, with our common agenda and the Wild Virginia blog. Um, so um, I've been fortunate um, to have my images out there and to share them um, with other people. And, and from the very beginning of my photography journey back in Maine, I always wanted my images to inspire others to appreciate our natural world and wildlife. And probably if there was a, uh, a, uh, a field of um, conservation photography back there, I, back in 1990, I probably would have started out as a conservation photographer. 
I always had that in my heart. So in 19, in 2020, I, I took a conservation photography course to develop my storytelling and writing skills. I've always um, enjoyed writing, and um, so I wanted to kind of develop them into more of a story storytelling style to go with my photography. Um, and since 2020, I have mainly focused on conservation photography and developing my storytelling skills. I've had the honor to have a couple article text packages posted online on um, several local um, Virginia conservation blogs. And, and I, I continue to pitch, you know, article image ideas to magazines um, looking to um, go more national as well. Um, I pretty much have, have kind of created a, a good um, local niche here in Virginia with my photography. Um, and one thing about the picture that I have here on the screen is a series of, of a brown pelican at, um, in silhouette at sunrise at a local um, park here in Hampton. Um, and it's in the middle of, it's starting its head throw behavior series. And that morning, uh, when I saw that behavior, which I had never um, photographed that behavior um, and seen it so much, that morning, as, as I did that morning, but that started the thoughts of, well, I, I would like to write a story about that. And that began my thought and my pursuit to change from just being a bird photographer mainly um, to um, being a conservation photographer. Um, doing conservation, wildlife, and nature photography. So I owe the pelicans, you know, the the due for changing, kind of changing my gears in, in photography. Um, I also have a blog, as, as you mentioned, Linda, um, and I, I regularly post there. I try, I try to post, you know, once a week and about my conservation journey and also give out photography tips and techniques and, and, and share a lot of images because I love to share my images. That's that's why I love photography is to share images that, that I photograph. And and like most photographers, um, especially if you're doing it professionally, um, you know, you, you kind of expand and do other areas of photography. So I do sell fine art prints and on-demand products through um, accounts at Fine Art America and Zazzle. And I also have a monthly newsletter. So if you'd like to uh, sign up to that, I, I talk a, a lot about some of my in-the-field experiences. Um, I have a behind-the-shot feature I do each month where I talk about um, how I took that image and um, and I just give monthly updates um, and just um, and talk about certain conservation um, issues that are that are going on and and I do just want to mention one last little note to share um, I've been a uh, battling uh, with a, a rare genetic rheumatological disease. Um, it's called Bichette's disease. Um, and over the last seven years, and um, and you may see it, and you may not see it. Um, might have seen it earlier um, when we were on the big screen, but intermittently my eyes do close um, and my voice uh, does change a little bit. Um, so I just wanted you to be a little aware tonight. So if, if you see those things, 
Um, but it does impact my photography, but I have a, a, a wonderful spouse who helps me out a lot. And uh, so um, I just wanted to share that. Okay, so let's let's talk about what is conservation photography and storytelling. Conservation photography is a creation of photographic images that tell stories and inspires people to take action or change the behaviors or to advocate for conservation outcomes, um, protecting nature and improving the biodiversity um, in our natural environment. Some of the conservation topics um, that are very popular these days is climate change, um, barriers uh, to um, animal movements such as wildlife corridors and crossings, land uses, um, wa water quality and quantity, um, and a couple big topics that I focus on is wildlife habitat losses and wildlife habitat defragmentation. defragmentation. Conservation storytelling is a powerful way to combine your texts and images by highlighting current conservation topics by using knowledge and the experiences and even con your connections with others by affecting change through the use of images and writing. The emergence of conservation photography um, is credited and was pioneered by Christina Metemeyer, who is a marine biologist and an environmental activist um, and she really developed that the concept of the field of conservation photography um, when she created um, in 2005 the International League of Conservation Photographers, which is known as ILCL, ILCP. Um, and through ILCP, she provides a platform for, for photographers. Um, environmental and wildlife issues. So um, before 2005, there really wasn't a field of conservation photography. And so it since 2005, it's been growing and, it, and it's really um, become really a popular field of photography right now. And the mission of the ILCP is to support environmental and cultural cultural conservation <clears throat> through ethical photography and filmmaking and that they believe that all inspiring photography is a powerful tool in preserving the environment so now let's discuss what what is wildlife conservation photography we've talked a little bit that what is actually conservation photography. Well, wildlife conservation photography is pretty much the same thing, but you're, you're, you're dealing with um, conservation efforts that are solely focused on wildlife and their habitats. Um, the wildlife images can be a major influence in creating areas of wildlife protection um, documenting a, spe a species or a loss of habitat, um, an endangered or threatened um, wildlife species, um, and as well as just educating people on wildlife and our planet's natural environment. And then the, the picture here that I have um, displayed here of the eagle um, is probably one of the, the most um, best known conservation success stories there has been um, from when it was in in the on the endangered species act list to now um, being off the list um, so um, 
spreading the word makes a big difference in conservation. And changing to um, kind of in 2020, changing over to uh, concentrating on wildlife conservation uh, photography, I um, work on two main wildlife conservation photography projects. And um, I, one of the first things I did after, after deciding I want to do conservation photography, wildlife and nature conservation photography. I went looking around the, the local area where I live around the Hampton area and then throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I found an organization that that um, had very similar beliefs um, that I that I did about conservation, um, habitat connectivity, and um, I volunteered um with them and that organization is called Wild Virginia. So uh, I do um volunteer with Wild Virginia and the Virginia Safe Wildlife Corridors Collaborative. Um, and part of this project that I kind of work with them on is um I've been writing a, a series of articles and um on wildlife corridors and crossings and um and my first article um was what are wildlife corridors and crossings and, and why are they important to virginia so as you mentioned earlier in the opening i like to focus on issues that um, concern the co uh, the commonwealth of virginia but you know um, i'm also branching out a little bit these days um outside of Virginia, but you know, I mainly like to concentrate what's going on here in the uh, Commonwealth where I live. The other big conservation and photography project that I find very special to my heart um, is um, a uh, project I call Butterfly Oasis Habitat Project. And um, I moved into this house uh, where I'm living now in Hampton um, in uh, 2021. And after moving in, built a very small little butterfly garden in my backyard because uh, I was concerned about the decline of the population of the monarch butterfly. That, and that kind of inspired me to kind of create, get some milkweed, some butterfly bushes, and I, I created a nice little garden. And um, and through the summer, through the fall, um, I had several dozen um, monarch caterpillars come through um, through uh, my milkweed, ate it all up. Um, and, and then I also had um, some fennel in my yard. So I also had some black swallowtail um, caterpillars. Um, and uh, so it, it really became um, uh, kind of fun and exciting to see that. And so it inspired me to grab my camera and start taking pictures of, um, of the butterflies and the caterpillars in my yard. So, uh, so I did that last summer a lot. And then over the winter, um, I kind of came up with the idea to create this project, this conservation project on my own and um, to where I can um, document, um, write stories, um, take pictures and, and try to help the monarch butterflies um, increase their population. Um, and then this year, I also, um, in the spring, made a much bigger garden and added a lot more milkweed. Um, today I had like, um, 42-ish caterpillars in my, 
uh, garden. So um, I think it's doing well. Hopefully they will all survive. So um, with that, I uh, also um, took a course and became um, um, a, a citizen science for the monarch butterfly data by collecting the data, the, how many eggs and caterpillars and and uh, uh, adults that come through my garden. And I report that data with the monarch larva uh, monitoring project. So that gives me another way to um, make an important, um, have an important role in um, trying to increase the population of um, the monarchs. But I don't solely just concentrate on the monarchs because I love all butterflies and caterpillars. Um, um, and by the way, this caterpillar, the vertical caterpillar over here is the, the image of the American butterflies cover. <laughs> I just thought I filled that in. Anyway, um, so now that we know what conservation photography is, what wildlife conservation photography is, now we can look at some tips at how we can use um, our wildlife images for conservation purposes. And a lot of these tips are tips that I personally use um, in, in building um, in the last two years, um, building a um, conservation wildlife and nature uh, photography and storytelling um, career. Um, as I, I've now become an LLC. So um, I've taken it totally professional. So um, the first thing I would uh, suggest, if you're interested in, in being um, a conservation photographer or conservation storyteller or both, um, or just using um, your images for conservation purposes, you know, um, every once in a while, you know, it always help. It's always helpful. But you want to find what interests you the most, you know. Especially, I suggest, you know, starting in your local area. You know, look for conservation, um, you know, topics. Um, but one one of the big topics here in, in Virginia is um, the seabird um, colony that had to be moved because of um, our bridge tunnel being um, under construction to uh, another little um, island called Port Wool. So, so, um, so there's a, a conservation project right there. So you can find find things in your area um, and. And if you're interested, you know, in birds or, or certain species or certain habitats, or um, you know, that that is always helpful to to be able to connect um, and give you a better chance to find um, key people, especially if you're doing a human interest based type conservation story. The next is. Um, and I've always set goals for myself. So you, you want to set goals and make an ultimate goal of what actions do you want to have at the end of your story? I mean, do, you know, do you want, you know, um, you know, your story to be able to, um, you know, if it was something endangered and, and in a habitat loss area, do you want to, your end story to be, you know, um, making sure that habitat loss area is is no longer a problem, so that an endangered species has that place to be, and uh, to continue to um, have that space to breathe and, and live. Um, and also, um, defining your role in conservation photography and storytelling is big because there are many different ways um, you can have a role in conservation photography and storytelling. You can do it professionally. You can do it on an amateur basis. 
as a hobbyist, as um, somebody who takes an occasional picture. Um, and you can do it as um, someone who just takes pictures as a conservation photographer, or you can also do it as someone who who are who only takes um, the the pictures and has somebody else write the stories for them, or they only uh, sell their pictures to magazines. And then you also have um, the storytelling, the writing story storytelling um, conservationist um, that that just tell the stories and look for photographers to um, get their conservation photography um, pictures um, for their stories. Um, and then, you know, as I said, as, as a hobbyist or, or um, somebody who does occasional photography, you know, you can occasionally use an image for a conservation purpose. So, some way to make an impact. You know, you just want to define and figure out what you want to do with with um, your role in conservation photography. Um, also, um, you want to determine when you determine your subject. You want to know if you need to know anything about animal behavior of your subject or if there's federal regulations that affect your story idea. Um, research is always very important with conservation photography and storytelling. You, 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 you gotta really dig deep. Um, one, you gotta know if the story has already been told or if somebody else is working on it um, and, um, and should always try to keep a lot of that information under wraps, so um, so nobody knows that you're working on certain stories and stuff. But but um, that that is an important um, part of being uh, a conservation photographer and storyteller is um, doing research. Okay, uh, the my next tip is. You know, determine your audience. Um, who is going to be your audience? Will it be decision makers or the general public, um, or or both? Um, you, you want to to really make an emotional appeal to that audience that you want to target. Um, and I, that it makes your writing and your your pictures, your stories that you tell in your pictures and then your writing, it makes that so much more powerful um, to the the audience that you're looking to talk to. And like I said, I'm connecting with a local conservation organization um, in which you have similar beliefs or goals, I think is a great way to get into conservation photography. It's, it's how I really was able to um, to build my conservation photography career um, by um, by volunteering um, um, I, with Wild well, Virginia. I'm a, I'm a, a partner for, uh, photographer um, and also I volunteer on the uh, communications team. So um, I have a couple roles that I that I play with them. And then occasionally I will donate um, some of my images for them to use in their conservation com campaigns. Also um, creating a blog, um, especially if you're looking at doing this as a career, as a part-time career, you know, um, whatever way that you're looking to be a part of conservation photography, um, creating a blog and writing essays and stories on conservation subjects that 
mean the most to you is a great way to display a portfolio of conservation photography storytelling, which will bring awareness to your wildlife conservation stories and and or if you have wildlife conservation projects. But it also is a great way to bring attention to you as a conservation photographer. Um, that having a blog has is, is immensely helped me um, with my conservation photography career. And then, and then like I, I mentioned before, if you're not interested, um, and not, not everybody is interested in writing stories, um, some people just like to go out and take pictures um, and sometimes just going out and taking um, a hike or a walk or, you know, or just going out for, um, for photography purposes without any conservation purposes in the back of your head, um, that, that can be useful as well, because um, you know, later on, um, you may find that image can be um, used in a conservation purpose that you might not have thought of when you were out in the field taking that picture. And my final tip that I've, I've found to be one of the biggest um, things that has really helped to get my photography my conservation photography out um, into the public is the social media platforms. Um, I, I share you know, my conservation stories and projects um, with the general public to, to bring awareness to, to not only those subjects, um, like, like the monarchs, you know, I, I, I write a lot about monarchs on my blog and newsletter social media, um, uh, <clears throat> you just um, never know who you meet out there in social media, and you may find somebody who comes and asks for you to do a presentation or, uh, or an interview. I've, I've been asked for, to do interviews, um, so um, you, you, you just don't know. So um, I I recommend the social media. Um, and here I was just going to show um, a few examples of what I was talking about when I was just going out because I liked photography. I love photography. Going out and taking pictures is is what I love the most. It, it's therapy. It's even therapy for me. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he, here I was just uh, taking a stroll at a local park area, saw this beautiful deer, took this beautiful image, and later on, um, uh, well, Virginia was interested in using it in a publication, and so that image became, you know, this full-page ad, and uh, a local um, uh, publication for Wild Virginia that they put out. And then this is uh, another little similar um, case. This is just went to the local park, took a picture of the pelican on the post, and um, a different um, conservation um, organization here. Um, and Virginia, um, Virginia Conservation Network um, used this in um, their, uh, com their Common Agenda Briefing Book, which is, is um, the policies that, that Virginia puts together um, and uh, conservation policies they put together for the year. So, um, so you never know when you're just out taking pictures that they can be used for conservation purposes. You don't actually have to go out to find a story and and take pictures on. But that's good too. Um, 
there's others just other ways and just a few more other picture random pictures um that i've taken that have been also published in local conservation um publications here in virginia um uh, sunrise uh, with the trees that i mean that was actually the real colors of the sky that was a, a beautiful sunrise um and um the dragonfly and and um uh, this is um Lake Drummond. Um, so, so just be aware of when you're out taking pictures, you know, and you go home and you process them, you know, there may be a purpose behind an image that you may find uh, useful for a conservation publication, you know, um, whether, you know, you submit them to the publication or, or you decide to do donate an image or two. And then finally, um, these are really the, the main points that that I, I wanted to share tonight, and that's how your photography can help save the world as a conservation photographer. There is always a story to tell, even if it's in your backyard, like my, like my backyard butterfly garden. Um, through photography, we all have the power to tell conservation stories and be an advocate for something that truly moves you or a subject that you want to protect. And as photographers, we always have the opportunity to document the changes in our natural world. And we can share those um, with others. Um, so those that are not as aware become more aware of um, the changes that, that we have in our, our wildlife habitats, um, the wildlife defectations, the wildlife crossing issues. So, um, but mainly your wildlife images just can have a powerful effect and can help save the world or wildlife species just as I was talking about with the wildlife crossings, um, uh, you know, by here in Virginia, working on the wildlife crossings and um, and corridors, um, you know, that very well may save a deer, a deer, a bear, raccoon's life um, if we can uh, get that legis legislation passed here in Virginia. So these are. Um, some of the tips that I've used to um, create a um, a conservation career um, and and photography um, and storytelling and um, then you know if you like to reach out to me um, you can find find me everywhere um, I'm on Instagram Facebook Twitter LinkedIn Flickr um, so um, so that's um that's all that I have. Um, does anybody have any questions? So there is there is a question. I'm gonna get you to um take your screen down and let me look for it real oh, quick. Okay. Um yep, Mika, yep, Mika I got had, yeah, Mika had a question. Um she was curious about which social media do you find is the most effective for this purpose? Most effective. Um the main two that I use is Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. At first, when I first started those two, um, I found Twitter to be the most effective. Yeah. Um, and, and it's still very effective. Um, but lately, I've been getting more off of Instagram and and often too um, when I use social media I, like I said I like to do research um, I also look at the likes you know what what images are people liking at, you know on my on my social media or where are they making contacts and and so, you know, that helps me when I do like photography exhibits, 
I know what images are popular and what may sell. So uh, there's a lot of ways to use social media, but but right now um, I've really been finding Instagram a, a, a little bit more helpful, but Twitter is still um, a very great tool and I am on them both every day. Okay. Um, Anne has a question in here. She wanted to know, um, how did you figure out what to charge for your images and text? Is that something, I, I know sometimes when we're working with magazines, they have a set price for yeah. what yeah. they, they have a budget and, and they'll say, this is what we're going to pay you for a cover. This is what we're going to pay you for a story with photos. So is that kind of your experience? Yes, it is. Um, just about probably ninety nine percent, you know, of the magazines um, do have their own prices. Mm -hmm. What they're gonna give you for um, a text article package, or or just a cover image, or just an image that's used in a, in the publication. They have their own prices so that they can um, charge um, okay. um, or or pay you, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that's that's kind of been my personal experience. And then, basically, anytime you're working with a magazine, a print magazine, or even even in a digital um, sense, magazines have they have a rate. So they kind of keep it, you know, kind of, kind of in the, in, I won't say universal, but universal to them. So that sounds great. Um, Dawn is curious, if an image of yours is used as a cover, are you prohibited from selling it privately? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I don't see prohibited from using from selling it privately, mm -hmm. um, uh, if it's a copyrighted, if you copyrighted your images um, and you did not give your copyright to a publisher That's um, for that cover, you still own the copyright of your image and you still can do what you would like to do with that. And I do highly suggest copywriting you know, with the U.S. Copyright Office, you know, all images. Yeah, um, just but I ha but I haven't had that experience. So yeah, um, it, it's part of the light. Well, I don't know. I don't want to speak for everybody, but it's part of the licensing. So if a lot of uh, printers, public publishers, will ask for first rights, let us be the first to publish it, and that's yeah. what they will almost insist on. Um, right. They don't care. They don't seem to care what you do afterwards because they are just paying for that one time usage. Um, right. When I have a, uh, somebody I know who's um, sold his images, uh, they were on the first iPhone boxes. And um, somebody contacted him uh, representing an agency who was, you know, working with Apple. And they said, hey, how much are your photos? And, and he's, you know, he threw a number and the person on the other end laughed and said, that's not really what we're going to pay you. We're going to give you a couple of other zeros. And it worked out really well for him. But he basically right. gave up rights to those images. But it seems like magazine, magazines don't seem to be as uh, interested in that. It's kind of a one-time use. They just prefer that it's never been published before. But um, you yeah, know, you know, you, you can print. Um, you own it. You've not given given away the rights and deleted them off your hard drive. So hopefully that yeah. kind you're, of answers. You're, you're very yeah, you're very correct with that. Okay. Donna says, you've mentioned entering contests. I have noticed quite a few contest rules that require you to give up your rights to the image. Has this been your experience? Well, um, if that is a stipulation, I do not enter those contests. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, it's I, really haven't had, I haven't had that um, yeah. happen to me so far. 
Yeah, that is in the fine print, Donna. That was one of the things that we covered, or um, when I say we, I, I was in the audience, um, that Paul Malinowski talked about in his presentation last week about um, cracking the code on photo contests. It, it varies from contest to contest. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I will say um, I entered nature.org's natural is the um, nature conservancy contest mm -hmm. several years ago it was one of the first contests that i entered probably i've only entered like three contests um that was like probably my first or second one and it turned out to be an image that resonated with a judge who then kicked it to uh the state level um uh, specifically for for them to you know hey you guys need to look at this and they are like we we just need you to sign off so we can publish it um i didn't lose my rights but they wanted to be able to use it for you know supporting what they were doing and and that was something i was okay with because of what the um the organization was but read those yeah. fine Grants because um, yeah. you don't want, you don't want no, to get in a situation where you lose your your stuff. Um, no, you don't. You don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I agree. Very, with every little word. Yeah, but they're very specific, and and you you get a feel for you know. There's some shysty contests out there, I think, and then there are some very very you know really legit ones. So it it just it it you know it it just depends. Yeah. Um, and I usually only enter ones that are, you know, really legitimate. Um, and um, and I do enter, you know, here in Virginia, um, I do enter a few local contests. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've done well in those local photo contests, but they ask, you know, I still read those rights even though the local you know um mm -hmm. based that uh, they're not national wildlife or, or nature conservancy um type mm -hmm. photo contest but i still read every little word you know yeah. um to make sure you you don't you lose that right. right for that image because that you just never want to give rights away for your mm -hmm. images Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, Anne's question is, what does having the LCL, what does having an LLC do for you? An LLC? Mm -hmm. Um, well, it just makes me a formal formal business for sure. Um, uh, it, it, it's really nothing too much different. Um, yeah. you know, as in you know what I'm doing. Um, as photography you know it's just you know but better bookkeeping and and yes. you know um business type um it helps and, your it, it keeps your um just kind of general thing is it keeps your books separate it it, it helps with you taxes taxes yeah. um um it also uh protects your personal assets so that's, it, I mean, that's it, the reason that, you know, people it, do it. Yeah, yeah. It does. And um, a, a lot, a lot of photographers, uh, professional photographers are LLCs, um, you know, to give them that, that extra protection. Um, a lot of uh, photographers do workshops and, and, you know, it things helps. like that, that yeah. really benefits um, them um, in ways. So, um, it also you know, but it, it, it was just, you know, to me, it's, I have my own photography business. It is, it is mine, you know, so, um, well, you know, just, you know, I just did it a couple months ago, so, yeah. so okay. it's all, all new to me still. Yeah, and I, I have to be careful of this because we don't want to make it, you know, a, a giving legal advice because that's something we can't <laughs> do, but um, if you are, are starting to sell or wanting to do workshops, um, needing to get insurance. Those are things that will help you as a business owner. And it really does establish you as, you know, there's a little shingle there. And, and when people are going to pay you money to take them on these big trips, 
they feel like, you know, it's not just you're going to run off with their money. It, it's, it, it just, it's, it's a legitimate uh, protection for you and, and your business. So, yes. um, very true. okay. I'm not seeing anything else. Lori, this was a very, very well thought out presentation. Um, Thank you. One of, the, one of the social medias, I think we talked about it. I'm not sure who was on. I know it wasn't on the recording, but um, social media. I love it. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. That's 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 where I have met a lot of my friends and and other photographers. Um, you know, a lot of people in this room I've met through Instagram, but I've not met in person. But um, it's kind of fun to have you know people that like what you like, and it's mm -hmm. nice to have friends that support you and um, you know kind of push you forward. But Lori and I met through LinkedIn, right? Yes. So that, yes, and, we did. you know, I, you know, I've been trying to encourage people to try different forms of, of social media. It's one more outlet to get your work out there. Um, LinkedIn is really one of those places where you're just putting your stuff out there and you want, you're looking for a job, but as a photographer, yeah, there's gonna be some photography jobs, but who cares about those? But there are all these other people that are going to find you and they could be business owners like lawyers or doctors that need art. And that is yes. where they live is on LinkedIn or, you know, so it's another place to it, it. It's a slow growing kind of space, but it's a place where you can say I was just published you know, and you can and kind of build your little resume in the photography world. So, yes. Um, you know, that's one of the things that has helped me is putting those little, you know, I was, I was published here or this is what I'm, or this is the project I'm working on. And I have had people approach me, Hey, this is our project. Can you help us? And it's because they're finding me on LinkedIn. These, these types of professionals are not hanging out on Instagram with me. They are looking for somebody to, uh, provide them with images for their business newsletters or whatever their their project is. So it's just yes. one more place uh, a different audience is going to find you. So with that, I'm going to thank you for coming and doing this. I know this is getting a little late on your end because you're on the East Coast, but really enjoyed your presentation. It was lovely to meet you. And um, when people come and give up their time, to somebody they met on social media like me, I, I just, I get, I'm a little overwhelmed and appreciative. And um, I so, 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 um, and it was excited to have you. So thank you for hanging in there and, and coming and doing this for my group. Well, thank you very much, Linda, for inviting me. It's been an honor and privilege to um, share and talk about conservation wildlife conservation photography um, with everyone and um it's always always fun to uh, to meet new people and um and hopefully um you know maybe we'll see I, a few names i see that i've connected on instagram as well so um you know maybe um be able to connect more um yeah it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool thing all right you guys can connect with Lori through her website, lauriacash.com and on Instagram at lacashphoto. And I'll include those links in the show notes. We're off next week, but please join us on September 7th when astrophotographer Sherry Hunt joins us to share some tips in her presentation using photo pills for night sky photography. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful and hope that we see you again soon.